morning, uh, our presenters and participants. Welcome to the Virtual Beauty Soul International Convention 2021. On behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to thank you so much for your participation and contribution to our annual convention success. We are Hương and Tung uh, as the presentation's moderators. We are delighted to see all of you in light of virtual presence today, especially in this parallel live oral presentation and workshop. We do hope that all of you will be able to have some valuable knowledge and experience as takes away following the talk. Before the presentation, there are a uh, there are a few considerations in case you have any questions or concern about the presentation. Please feel free to leave them in the chat box so that we can gather the question for easy response in the 5-10 minutes Q&A session. We, uh, first, we gladly welcome Dr. Rob Waring in this parallel live 60 minutes workshop, which entitled how do I do ex extensive reading without money or resources? About our presenters, um, Dr. Rob Waring is a professor at Notre Dame Saisin University in Okayama. He is an acknowledged expert in extensive reading and vocabulary acquisition. Please welcome Dr. Rob Waring. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? That's great. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, good morning again. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Please, sorry, sorry, Rob. Uh, I can't hear you. Um, I, you can't hear me. Can everybody else hear me? Sure, I can hear you. You can okay, hear me fine. Yeah, yeah. Don't speak it. Moderator. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Okay, so I will continue. I will continue. Um, okay, so uh, my session this morning is about how do I do extensive reading without money or resources. Thank you. And the um, talk today is uh, to continue what I was talking about yesterday in the keynote speech. Uh, in the keynote speech, I was making the case for extensive reading and uh, why we do it. So um, today I want to focus on Oops, we're going too far, too fast. Today's talk is um, a little bit of a reminder what extensive reading is. Uh, some of you yesterday maybe didn't see the keynote talk and I would encourage you to go back and watch uh, the recording so that you can um, follow um, some of the points I'm making today. In fact, yesterday's recording was um, of course uh, quite intense. There was lots of information. Uh, this session also has lots of information. Uh, there's no way you can catch all the points from today, so I will make the slides available for you. And also uh, the recording, please have a chance to look at it again. Inside the recording, uh, inside the uh, presentation today, I have many links for you. Um, you will have access to the PowerPoint and you'll have access to all of the links uh, so uh, don't feel you have to write everything down and copy everything down. Everything will be here for you. So uh, just a quick review over what is extensive reading and why would we do it. We're then going to look at what the ideal environment would be. What would be the kind of aim of uh, a, a, an, a, an extensive reading program? And then the reality is for many people, there is you know, not much money, uh, very few resources and so on. So let's just review what is extensive reading. Extensive reading involves reading a lot of easy books to build reading fluency, reading speed fluency, and build comprehension skills. And uh, study reading, by comparison, is to intensively study the language to learn words, grammar, and language features through reading. So yesterday, I made the distinction between learning to read and reading and listening to learn. And yesterday I mentioned that we learn to read by using textbooks, worksheets, tests, and so on. Um, 
everything is done as a class. The focus is on phonics or alphabet, vocabulary building, uh, new words and grammar, reading skills, and so on. And this is typically done with textbooks. Uh, extensive reading, the reading and listening to learn, is using graded readers and storybooks. I'll mention these again in a minute. And to build fluency, focus on comprehension, and a natural reading practice. So the top one we call reading study or uh, intensive reading, and the bottom one is extensive reading. And the point I made yesterday is that this is the missing piece of the puzzle. Very, very, very many programs do not have this extensive reading, which is the glue that holds everything together. And the difference between the two is like learning to drive and enjoying the skill of driving. If you are wanting to learn to drive, you need to study the rules, you need to go to a school, you need to have a teacher next to you, and maybe there's going to be some kind of test. And that's the same with learning to read. You need to learn the words, the vocabulary, you need a teacher, and maybe you need to be tested. But that's not where you really learn to drive smoothly and drive well. Driving smoothly and driving well, enjoying the drive, enjoying the reading, means you need to actually get onto the road and even be able to deal with difficult driving conditions like this. So it's an important distinction that you can explain to your students. The slide I showed yesterday at the end of the session were, was this one. The reasons we must do extensive reading are to provide massive fluent reading practice, to recycle important, useful words in grammar time and time again for long, term acquisition, to consolidate and strengthen partly known language, build reading speed, build depth of knowledge, and for it to be enjoyable. So there's lots and lots of reasons. Please go back and look at the keynote if you are not quite sure. So if we now think about this question, which material should we use for extensive reading? Should it be storybooks or textbooks with exercises? Well, we know, of course, that this is for intensive reading or study reading. So these are the kinds of books we need to use for extensive reading. Should the reading be easy or difficult? This, of course, is easy text, and this one is very difficult. Words like cyclotron, spectrometry, immo, I can't even read this one, Im, immunohistochemical. I don't know what that means. So. Um, which one? Of course, it should be easy reading because we can read quickly and smoothly and meet lots of language. The next one, should the reading be slow and careful where you're reading maybe with your finger or you're reading uh, very intentionally? Well, clearly you should be reading quickly because then you can build reading speed, automaticity and so on. Should we be using a dictionary? Well, in study reading, then you would probably use your dictionary a lot. And that's fine because you're trying to study, you're trying to learn something. But when you're reading a book for pleasure, for fun, you shouldn't really need a dictionary. You should be reading something where you don't need the dictionary. And I think it's really key to understand that. We're going to later talk a little bit about what kind of materials you're going to need. So should the students be studying the vocabulary and grammar or reading for fun? Well, clearly reading for fun is the right thing to do. So what's your job as a teacher, as a teacher of extensive reading? What would you do? What kinds of things should you do as a teacher? Well, the first thing you need to do is to check that they understand, the students understand why they need to read extensively. So you can mention some of the points I mentioned about reading speed, about fluency, about massive practice, about consolidating language, you can explain this to them. You have to make sure they're reading at the right level, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Make sure they're not reading something too difficult because that then becomes study reading. There's nothing wrong with study reading, but we shouldn't only do study reading. So you need to check to make sure they understand their book. So you could ask them, How's your book? Can you tell me the story? Tell the story to your partner. Make sure they're actually understanding. If they're not understanding, maybe they need to read something else. Make sure they're doing enough of it. 
yesterday I mentioned the minimum amount should be one hour a week of uh, of fun reading. Minimum, absolute minimum. And that's the uh, minimum because of the relationship between how frequently you meet new words and how quickly they are forgotten. So you need to have that sweet spot. Make sure they can choose the right books. So you need to teach them how to choose a book. Make sure that they can monitor their own reading and they can think, you know, is this too difficult? Am I reading this? Well, do I understand this? Make sure that they can monitor and decide, nope, this book's too difficult. Let me put it down. Nope, this book's too boring. Let me put it down. Make sure they're going to let you know if they face troubles in some way. Make sure they're actually reading it, not just pretending to read. And the last one, make sure they're motivated. So these are some of the key jobs that you'll need to do. So once you've built your library, whether it's a digital library, a paper library, a book library, a lot of your work as a teacher has been done. As an extensive reading teacher, after the library's built, the teachers just watch the students choose books and read. You don't have to do anything. You've got no lesson plans to make, no tests to give, and no marking to do because they are just reading and talking to each other. You can ask the students to manage the library themselves. That's very important. So they feel an emotional attachment to the library and the students can discuss their reading or write about it together. This is important because the reading then becomes writing or the reading becomes speaking, which becomes listening. So there's skill transfer, but also um, they can share which books are good, which books they like, which books they don't like, and so on and so on. If you really, really want to have a quiz, then online quizzes are okay. And yesterday, Tom Robb mentioned a website called mreader.org. And the last thing is that um, one of the things that you're going to find is your class will do better on the end of year test than a class not doing extensive reading. And one of the things that I make a kind of joke here, that once you've built your library as an extensive reading teacher, there's not really a lot to do except monitor the library. So who here is a lazy teacher? If you're a lazy teacher, extensive reading is a lazy teacher's best friend, right? Now, of course I'm joking, but it's quite an easy thing to do. Once you set up the library, once you set up the systems, you don't have to worry about lesson plans and tests to give and marking because the students are learning, learning probably a lot more than they would by the textbook. Of course, I'm joking here, but you see my point that it's relatively an easy thing to do. But what's important as a teacher is to make sure you, the students know their level. Now, you do not know what level the students are. You can never know what level because only they know what's a comfortable reading level. So you should ask them to do this. Can ask them, can you read something quickly and enjoyably with adequate comprehension so you don't need a dictionary. If they can do that, if they can say, yes, I can read something quickly and enjoyably with adequate comprehension, I don't need a dictionary, that's the right level. R-E-A-D. So if they can read, then that's the book at the right level. If they say it's a bit too difficult, comprehension's a bit hard, then maybe find something else. So the point here is that if they're reading at the right level, then maybe we do not need to test them. You probably don't need to test them because this is the test. If they can adequately comprehend it, why are you testing them, right? Maybe you just need to make sure that they're sharing the reading. So what kinds of materials should be used for EFL learners? And I suspect that the majority of you here have EFL learners. You're not, you, you're not teaching native speakers of English. Your students are probably are not returnees who are really, really fluent in English. They are probably typical Vietnamese students in middle schools, 
in uh, high schools, maybe elementary stu students, maybe university students, whose English is probably lower than intermediate level. The vast, vast, vast majority of students are like that in Vietnam. So the EFL learners only meet English a few, few hours a week. They learn in class settings. They're probably going to forget quickly, as I mentioned yesterday, and they need systematic recycling of vocabulary and grammar. So the solution here would be to find books which are um, graded readers. Now we need to understand this relationship between uh, comprehension and speed. If you give them material which is very difficult, it's slow, intentional reading, high effort, frequent loss of comprehension, that's not very good. If the reading is slow with many, many pauses, loss of comprehension, frequent dictionary use, that's not good either. If it's fast, fluent with high comprehension, high involvement in the story, and they're just reading in a kind of flow, that's fine. We call this type of reading, reading pain. This type of reading is the study reading, and this is the extensive reading. So your job as a teacher is to make sure that they are finding this type of material. And if you can help them to do that, that would be great. So the books that they need, should it be books with lots of new words, books that are standalone, that are not connected to each other, and ones they read slowly, or should they read books with high frequency vocabulary that are written to recycle and strengthen vocabulary to work as a system, allow them to read easily and quickly with confidence. And of course, this is the right material to use. And we typically use, as I said yesterday, graded readers, these storybooks. Uh, these are paper versions, but also you can get these accessed um, through digital libraries, for example, X reading. And I'll mention X reading a little bit later. So these books here, as I said yesterday, are in various difficulty levels. Um, and they are written with an EFL language syllabus. As I said yesterday, um, each of these books has two to 3,000 words. If you read two books a week for a month, you're going to read more language in one month than you'll read in your entire textbook in one year. So you're going to learn a lot more by meeting huge amounts of language here. So it's critically important uh, that the students um, read a lot. So the big question is, are these the right books for your students? If you go to Fahasa, if you go to any English bookstore and you look, this is what you will see. This is the question, are these the right books for your students? Well, be very careful here because these books are written for native speakers. They're not written for Vietnamese learners. Books written for native speakers assume when you start reading, you already know 5,000 words. A four-year-old or a five-year-old starting reading already knows thousands of words. They already know a lot of grammar. So native speaker children reading uh, reading these books, they, they're not learning new vocabulary. They are learning the spelling of words and grammar they already know. So it's a very different learning experience. Native materials, be very, very, very careful with these because they're not necessarily suited, suited for Vietnamese students, unless your students are really, really advanced. Be careful. So these type of books, be careful using these type of books unless your students are nearly native speaker already. And the reason I mention this is if you analyze, let's say a graded reader version of a story, a story written for EFL students, or you compare the original story, look at the vocabulary here. This is the vocabulary frequencies from high frequency words to low frequency words. The red one is the simplified graded reader. And you can see here, there are not many rare or unusual words, but the, the native speaker version of this book, Frankenstein has lots and lots of rare words, which the students probably do not need. So be very careful about choosing these types of materials, okay? So now to move on to the main part. 
how do we do extensive reading with no money and few resources? Now, I think it's important first to ground ourselves in understanding what an ideal ER program would look like. What should it look like in the future? So what can you build towards? Well, it would. Uh, there's, the first thing to say is there's no one ideal ER program. Every school is different. Every country is different. The uh, students are different, but it's likely to contain these things reading materials, a borrowing system. It has to be a location, it has to be somewhere. You're going to need some money. You're going to need some time allocated to building the library and of course, giving students time to read. And you're going to need support staff and you're going to need some external help, maybe from the school administration, maybe from the library. So these are some of the things that you'll need to, to manage. Now, if any of you are lucky enough to go to Tokyo, I strongly suggest that you visit this school. This is probably the world's best extensive reading program. There are 29 classrooms. Each classroom has 15 to 25,000 books in each classroom. So you can see all the way around the room here, there are books and books and books and books and books and books and books, yeah? So please go and visit. Um, this is the website here. Um, and go and visit the school. They do allow visitors for you to go and have a look and see what an excellent program this would be. So that's one good thing. Typically, what we do is we would have a library, something like this. Now, to me, this is a very, very boring library. You can see it's boring because the lady here looks bored herself, right? Um, this is boring, why? Because it's not an interesting display. All the books are facing with you the spine. There's no, there's no image of the books. There's no book display. It's very difficult to find what book to read. You know, students have to pick one out, then put it back, pick another one out, put it back. It's really difficult to see. This is a very unengaging library design. Yeah. Far better is to have something more like this. Easier to see. Some of the books are on display. This is a little bit more difficult, but you get the idea here. Here, there's an assistant who can help you choose the materials. This again is a very boring type of library. It's very difficult. Now they are categorized. You can see this is fantasy materials and so on. A little bit better, but there's no book displays to think about. Yeah, This is a better design. Here you can see the covers. You say, oh, USA, I want to read that one. And so um, you can actually uh, engage more with the library. It's easier to pick up a book, yeah? It's very difficult, oops. It's very difficult to pick up a book if, if the books are all facing on the spine, yeah? Carousels are very useful. If you can also include some newspapers, that would be great. So this type of library is a much more engaging library. And of course they have somewhere comfortable to read. When you build your library, you have to tell the students what levels the books are. You can't just put all the books together, just bang, there's the books because the students don't know what's my level, what's not my level. So an easy way to do that is to have a color coding system. So the brown books are the easiest, the yellow, the blue, the green, up until the difficult books here. And on the books themselves, you put a piece of tape like this. So the students know that their level is, for example, blue. and put all the blue books together in one section. So for example, like this, you can see here, these are the green books, these are the pink books. And therefore it's easy for the students to quickly find their level without having to sort through many, 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 many books, get bored and then just pick any book that they like, which is probably the wrong book. So uh, if you have an audio system, many of the books come with a CD then put the CD and the book together in a little plastic packet, otherwise they will get separated, yeah? And put the books also in little boxes like that. Sometimes we have class books. So you may have one storybook for the whole class. And these ones we've colored red because it's a class set. Sometimes it's good to have the whole class reading a story. If a book is very, very popular, then I put gold uh, tape on the side. 
So students can easily see this is a popular book and probably will be something you can enjoy. So help the students do that if you can. Another thing you'll have to make is some reading record sheets. You'll need to make sure that you have, for example, uh, one piece of paper for the class. So here you've got all the different students and these are the different dates. And this is the code for the book. So Y would be yellow book 12. This would be pink book 34. And you just write this inside the cover. So in this way, you can record which books they're borrowing and cross it out when it comes back. So we know that Miguel has not returned this book because it's not crossed out. Or you can do it by having one piece of paper for each student. This is Fukumoto Aya's paper. She tells us which book she read, what the book number was, when she returned it, and maybe has a little comment. And you can count how much she's been reading. So this type of thing is very, very easy to make, is something you will have to do. So what's our problem? The problem is that often you, get, you have no money, no materials, no support, no idea what to do, no time, no space, no library, and no book space. So let's look at some of the solutions to these issues. The first one is no class time. Often extensive reading is not allowed to be part of the curriculum for various reasons, and often very good reasons. Things like, you know, we have a ministry um, a dictate, uh, we don't have space in the curriculum for it, uh, we have to do other things. We've only got two English classes a week. We can't give one class for extensive reading and so on. So if you can't build it into the, uh, the, the if you can't build it into the curriculum, then maybe create a school reading club. Or maybe you can assign reading for summer homework, or you can build a library treasure hunt where you can ask students to go and find certain books in the school library. For example, find a book about elephants, find a book about pirates, and they will go to the library and hopefully they will start to read. The next one is maybe you don't have space, maybe you don't have a cupboard, maybe you don't have a room, maybe the library doesn't have space. So maybe what you can do is get a cupboard like this uh, with a window, but have a lock on it. Lock up your books because they will definitely go missing okay um you can put them on a trolley and then you can move them around from classroom to classroom again be careful here you'll find that books will go missing like that so what some teachers do is they have a suitcase make a suitcase put the books inside the suitcase and you can just pull the suitcase to and from the library and of course you can have a key for this so you can lock up the books and if you have four or five different suitcases with books or reading materials inside, you can exchange them between the classes. The next one is staffing troubles. Maybe you don't have staff. Well, you're going to need help to spread the love by choosing books, who's going to choose the books, who's going to make maybe some te reading texts, how, who's gonna help build a library, who's gonna set up the borrowing systems, who's going to monitor the reading. So one thing you can do if you don't have school staff is to ask some of the senior students to be library managers for you. They could be library managers or buddy readers. They could help other students to read. Sometimes schools ask parents. Many parents are retired. They're, you know, they have a lot of free time. They would love to come to the school. And sometimes schools ask parents to come in to help to manage the library on a volunteer basis, right? So this is something that often would happen where students may even want to volunteer in the library, sort of work experience, for example. So money is another big issue. Money is definitely a big issue. In my experience, there's always money somewhere. I've consulted to about 100 or 150 different schools all over the world, and there has never been an issue with money. There's always a way to get money. So often a school principal has a secret emergency fund. They don't tell you this, but there's a secret emergency fund that all schools have this. So ask for that. Another thing you can do is to set up a research project. Speak to the government, speak to your city and say, I need 20 million dong 
I'm doing a research project. I need some books for my research project. This will be uh, a project that you can do. And in that way, you can get some books. <clears throat> Approach the government department with a video of the school. So this is our school. Oh, look, we have empty shelves for books. Could you please give us some books? Um, ask students to do sponsored reading. Um, what you can do is uh, you could ask the students to speak to their friends, speak to their parents and get sponsored for reading. So for every thousand or every page they read, they may get one dong or two dong or 10 dong. And they do this with several people. People make a promise to pay for every word or every page or every book that they read. And so your students read for three months. At the end of the three months, they say, I've read 5,000 words, 5,000 pages. Could I please have some money? And you use that money to buy books. You could ask parents uh, to help add very, very small fee. Um, this is often very, very successful. You could um, just add a very small fee. Um, maybe even it's $5 or maybe, you know, um, 10,000, 100,000 dong, that will help to buy a book or get the parents to buy one book per student. Add a very small amount to the, to the book, to the school fees. Similarly, you could ask for book donations from home. Many, many parents in Vietnam and other countries buy books for their own children. But once the children have read them, the books just stay on the shelf. So ask the homes to donate to the school any books that they may have. Ask donations of money from local companies. So maybe ABC company is a very big company in your town. Ask ABC company to donate some money for a library and they maybe can have a little sign saying generously donated by ABC company next to the library. And that's good for the company and good for you. Some schools have a vending machine where you buy, you know, drinks or, or something, and the profit from that can be used for uh, buying books. Uh, make a call for donations from parents with a nice flyer. Um, ask parents to donate things that they don't need. So maybe there's some old clothes or an old chair they don't need. And maybe at the school festival, you can sell these clothes or sell cakes or cookies or lemonade or something and get the parents to maybe help and the students to help to sell things, to recycle things, and the money is used to buy a library. So as I say, there's lots of ways that you can get money. Of course, you're going to need to speak to the school to ask permission to do this, because if you do this without permission, maybe there's some trouble. So be careful about doing that. Another way to get money is from the Extensive Reading Foundation. This is an international organization, which I'm a member of, that uh, helps to build extensive reading globally. When they have grants, up to $5,000 is available. So um, go to the ERF website and maybe make an application for this. Uh, the application is to research extensive reading, to conduct projects and creation of model extensive reading programs, yeah? Now this is only restricted to um, I beg your pardon, it's, uh, it excludes countries with high incomes. So for example, Japan, no, Korea, no, um, you know, USA, no, but um, there are many other countries can be included, yeah? So there's intense competition for this. So you have to write a very good grant application. Another place to get money is from these organizations, of course, Rello, American English, uh, British Council, they often have money or research projects. New Zealand, Australian government often have projects where you can ask for money from them. And uh, very often these things are available for you. So the next uh, resource problem is support. Maybe you don't know how to do extensive reading. So um, there are often help in your area. So for example, we have ER associations in Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam. Italy, Indonesia, Middle East, China, many other places. And this is our Facebook extensive reading page. You can ask for help here in English or Vietnamese, doesn't matter. This is a free guide to extensive reading that tells you all about why we do extensive reading, how to set up the program, how to build a library, 
extensive reading activities, lots of free information available here at the erfoundation.org website or ercentral.com also has lots and lots of free material for you to, um, to look at. So how do you actually get books? Well, the first thing to do is to beg. Um, so often if you approach the publisher and you say, I wanna start an extensive reading program, do you have any free books that I can try? Can I pilot some of your books? And sometimes they may give you one or two books. If you go to a face-to-face -face conference, you can go to the book stand and say, are any of these I can use as a donation? Can I have a sample? Um, sometimes there's a book raffle at conferences. Maybe you could ask friends or colleagues for spare copies of their books. Maybe some of your colleagues uh, had some English books when they were studying at university. Ask them, please, could you bring in any books that you don't, uh, don't use? Any English books sitting around your home? Please bring them in, yeah? And as I said, ask for donations or approach the publisher and say, I want to do a research project using Pearson, Macmillan, Oxford books. Could you please give me 20 books? I'll do a research project for you and I'll give you a report. You can also borrow books. So some schools have a library that's shared. You share your library with another school in your area. So, you know, uh, rather than just have your own materials, if you have two or three schools and you can rotate the books between the schools, make sure you know, you know which books belong to which school, but uh, a way to build your library to have more materials available is to share the library among schools. Or you can maybe borrow from the local city library. That's quite successful. Many, many students don't have time to go to the library or the libraries to the, the, the city library, or the city library is too far away. So it's good for the library to lend their books to the school so the students can see it. The students then are told, if you want to read more of these books, go to the city library. So that helps the city library and helps the school, yeah? Or you can team up with local book clubs. Maybe your city has local book club and ask your students to join a local book club. Another thing that you can do is create your own materials. And this is an idea I do with my students. So I tell my students to find, a, find something they're interested in. Go to the internet, find a magazine, find something that you like. And this student here has chosen something about an animal called the Tasmanian devil. And she printed this out from a web page. Then what she did, this is a Japanese student, she then found the words that she didn't know. And she, you can see here, she's written in Japanese what these words are. So what she's now doing is uh, reading this intensively and she's checking the words that she doesn't know. Now what she does is she brings this paper to school. She then tells her partner in English about what she read. She said, I read this text called Tasmanian Devil. Tasmanian devils are blah, 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 blah. Now, hopefully, because she has this new vocabulary, she'll be able to uh, use this new vocabulary and uh, help her partner. The, the next stage here is she now gives this text to her partner. The partner reads it. Now, the text that the partner reads is now easier. Why? because many of the difficult words have already been translated. If there's a word that the second student doesn't know, the second student also can write on this. So what's happening here is that if you ask the students to go and get a text, it might be a recipe, it could be lyrics of a song, it could be a newspaper article, it could be anything, it doesn't matter anything the student is interested in. Get them to bring the paper to class after they're translated, explain it, discuss it and share it. And if you ask the students to bring in one piece of paper like this every week, and they share the pieces of paper, they're taking home two or three papers a week, they therefore have graded simplified material that they can read. And by the end of the semester, you'll have hundreds of student selected, student interest, 
student simplified work and you've done nothing. All the work's been done by the students and you have an instant extensive reading library. Another thing that you can do is to find an article. So for example, like this one, and I'm now going to just change to uh, my other, I'm going to change to a web page for a moment. So just a second, this one. So let's say, for example, you are reading BBC and you found this article here and you think, wow, I want my students to read this. But maybe there's some difficult words here. So what you do is you select the text like this, copy, you go to a website called the Online Graded Text Editor. It's at ercentral.com. I'll give you the slide in a minute. You go in there and you paste in the text like this, okay? You paste in the text, you choose your level, say, oh, my students are kind of like, maybe they're high intermediate, maybe they're, they're, they're mid intermediate students. So you want to make sure this is the right level for them. And what this does is it analyzes all of the words and it finds out which words are level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which words are outside the level, which are probably too difficult. And when you select go, it analyzes this text and it can tell you that the words in black are up to the selected level. The words black with the red underline is word that's probably out of level. So therefore, maybe you need to edit that. And you can say, oh, this is a bit too difficult for my students. Let me find another text. If you choose to wish, um, of, so you want you say excessive, and then you might want to change this to too, too much homework, you can then reanalyze. And now it's simple for your students. So this tells you here about what percentage is out. You should aim for about 95% or so. The words in pink are proper nouns. So this tool here is a free tool that allows you to, um, to uh, simplify text for students. There's another tool also on uh, ER Central uh, that's called Text Helper. And again, if you paste the students in, paste the text into here, and you choose the level of the text, which is my students are level nine, get the meanings. All of the words that they don't know will have a definition on the right here. All of these words will have a definition on the right. And if, you, if you're logged in, if you're registered to um, ER Central, you can then add these words to your ER Central account. And the words have been added. So now if we go to the My Words section inside ER Central, you can see that these words have just been added. So now the students can learn these words. So these are two websites that I think will be very useful for you. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So this is the process, find an article, put it into uh, the online graded text editor and so on. The second one I showed you was the text helper. And here you can see the translations here in Japanese. In fact, it does translations in Vietnamese too. So please think about that one. Oh, now, so these are, if you want to write your own materials, this is another thing you can do. Xreading.com publishes materials uh, also. So if you want to write your own materials, you have a story, you want to get some money for writing books, then Xreading allows you to do that. So now I want to talk a little about, a bit about um, some useful websites that have free materials. There are many, many, many websites with free materials. However, not all of it is good. Not all of it is good, okay? Um, we have to be very, very careful about pirating things. This is stealing from the internet. Please be very careful about this. The one main reason is often the copies are quite poor quality. They're quite hard to read on a screen. 
So if you if your students are reading on a screen, that's very, very difficult to read on a screen, right? You have to move around quite a lot. The other thing too, is that students honestly hate it. They would much prefer to have a physical book than have to scroll around a screen and go and find pirated copies. The other thing is that students know the teacher copied them from a website. And I think as teachers, our role is to not just um, not just teach students about English, but we're also models of good human beings. And the problem is that students know these are copied and it gives the message that stealing's okay. And I think that's maybe not a very good message we should be giving to our students, but be very careful about uh, pirating materials. So now I'm going to go through dozen, about 15 or 20 different sites that you can look at. I'm going to go through them very, 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 very quickly. Please look at the, uh, the, the slides, which I will put into, uh, the, give you the link later. We don't have time to look at all of these. So freegradedreaders.com, there's the URL. Ellie has some graded readers free material here. And you, know, you can read these things online. As I say, I'm going through them quickly. Please go through them slowly later or watch the video and stop it. Um, this is another place that has free graded reading materials uh, like this. This one here, uh, weloveenglish.com has lots of free materials, free graded reading materials here. And this is what they look like. Breaking News English has lots of material, uh, articles like this, and many, 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 many different follow-up activities. These are some follow-up activities for each activity, lots of follow-up activities for grammar, listening, many, many more role play, discussions, spelling tests, and tests, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. All of this is with every unit in Breaking News English. So a wonderful website. Another one is uh, Reading Skills for Today, has some test texts for you. English Club uh, has short stories. Five Minute English is another place. Bow Valley College is another one. My English Pages, they have videos too. Uh, ESL Lounge is another place you can get free reading material. Um, Bilingual Kids Spot, BBC Learning English. This is one Tom Brom mentioned yes, uh, yesterday. Um, be careful of this website, English e-reader. This is mostly pirated copies. They've stolen books from Pearson, put their own cover on it, and they're trying to sell them to you. They didn't write them. They're trying to sell them to you or get money from somebody else's work. And so please don't use these ones. Um, the uh, Victoria University Wellington has some graded reading material. Also Learn English at British Council has some material. ESL Bits, VOA News, Gutenberg has lots of native reader material. Uh, reader Theory. Uh, now be careful with choosing these free websites. Um, it's free, it's good, and there's some interesting materials. However, there's lots and lots of negative points, potentially. One problem is, is that often authors don't get paid. So um, we do need to make sure authors write stuff, they get money, so they will write more stuff for us, yeah? Now, a lot of those materials I just showed you are not for English as a foreign language. They are for ESL learners or native speakers. And as I said, be careful about that. They're often full of adverts. Sometimes the design of the website's uninteresting and a bit boring. Some, sometimes the topics are boring. Yeah. You know, John goes shopping. Really? You know, I mean, do we need to know about John going shopping? Um, there's often varied quality. Some of it's good. Some of it's not. Some of it's randomly selected. Many of the texts are very, very short for extensive reading, only 100 or 200 words. Texts are not written in a system. And this is a huge issue. Rob? The texts are not written as a system. Rob? They're Rob? random texts. Sorry, Rob, you have 10 more minutes. Yes, thank you. So um, the, um, the texts are not written as a system. 
They're written as standalone, not like a graded reader system from Oxford or Macmillan or Penguin. They're not written as a system. It's random input, yeah? There's no dictionary lookup for them. There's, websites are hard to navigate. It's difficult to know where you are. It's difficult to remember when you come back to the website, where was I, what was I reading, what did I read already? You maybe have to go to six or seven or eight different websites. It's impossible for a teacher to track what the students are reading. There's no recording of student data. You don't know what they read. You don't know if they understood it and so on and so on. The student cannot check if they understood it. Often these things don't have tests, right? So there's lots of negatives about this. So what I did was I created the, my own website um, to do this. So you've got to make sure that the website that you choose has enough materials that's got properly leveled material where the students can find their way um, and so on and so on and so on, right? So I created ercentral.com, which is completely free, completely free. You can register your students. Please use the website. Um, it has reading area, listening area, and so on. It has an area for teachers as well. You can create your, um, uh, your um, students. Um, uh, you can, you can uh, upload your students there. Um, there's a library, there's some information about the book, there's the reading text itself, which has a dictionary lookup. If you click on the word future, you get a dictionary lookup. It tells you what the word means. So that's really, really useful for students if they're reading and they don't know. Um, so also it, it uh, keeps a record of what you've been reading. Um, you can tell the other students if you liked the book. You have a quiz, so there's a quiz at the end of every story. And there's also a listening library as well. And you can just listen to the story or just read. And all of this is completely free, completely free. And you can upload your students and download the data. Um, so please consider using this one, yeah? There's also a speed reading panel. If for whatever, if, if you're lucky, and you have some money, then um, I would suggest that maybe you could uh, consider, oh, but this is a speed reading panel. Uh, you could consider using uh, another, oh, my mouse is no longer clicking. Why is my mouse no longer clicking? Hello, what's going on here? Okay, so if you want to set up a, a, an ER Central account, please just use the QR code and you can do that. So what I would ask you to do is um, if you're lucky and you want to, um, if you're lucky and you have a little bit of money, then I would suggest that you use the um, xreading.com. This is about 10 or $12 per year for the student. And this has the professionally published graded readers. Um, and again, you can upload your students. Um, there are many, many different publishers materials, all part of a learner management system. Uh, lots of information about the books. And here's the story. It also has listening as well. And you can have the speed uh, faster or slower when you're listening. And this is the story that the students would read. It's available for computers, also smartphones and tablets. And here is the data for the students. So if you have a little bit of money, then I hope that um, your school should um, um, be able to, um, to... Oh, come on, stop, thank you, my timer, okay. So please consider X reading as one option, yeah? If you want to find out more, please go to the Extensive Reading Foundation website. Lots and lots of information there for you. And remember that next year we have a conference on extensive reading in Indonesia. So that's all I have for the moment. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat window. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Um, now we have five minutes for the Q&A session. 
Uh, we uh, have received quite a lot of uh, questions in the chat box. Um, can you read okay, it? So I can see here, one of the challenges I have in applying ER is getting my students to read. Um, one of the challenges I have is um, applying ER, getting my students to read. There are always other things that are more attractive to them. Yes, there will be, you know, boyfriends are more attractive, sports is more attractive. Um, but you remember our main goal as teachers, what are we paid for? We are paid to help the students learn. And maybe they don't like doing it. I understand that. Nobody likes taking medicine, right? Even if they know it's good for them. But we do need to require this. We do need to require, that's part of our responsibility as teachers. Even if they hate it, it's still our responsibility as teachers. Now, of course, we don't want them to hate it, but my, the key will always be find interesting material. Find interesting material, find out what they like. Maybe even take them to the bookstore with you to choose. Really find out what they like. If they like skateboarding, find a book about skateboarding. So it's really important uh, to do that. The second one, how do you manage or assess their extensive reading? Um, my advice is probably don't assess them. If you do want to assess them, then uh, if you are reading graded readers, then you can use this website called mreader.org. If you have graded readers, published graded reader stories, storybooks, then use mreader. There's about 5,000 graded readers and all of them have a quiz on mreader.org. Uh, that's for teachers, there's no reading materials there. Uh, students read the book, they go to the website, take a test and you can download the data. But I would suggest the best way to assess them is not directly. I would assess them by asking them to tell someone else the story. That will let you know that they have understood it. If you want to test them, the problem is you have to have a test for every book that they read, which is a problem. So um, the key thing about extensive reading is that everybody's reading something different. They choose. So you can't make 30 tests. So what I would suggest you do is we also need to get away from the idea that reading always is followed by testing. We need to let them just get out of that idea. We need to just trust them that they will read. And rather than give them a test, rather than give them a test, it's better to assess them on the, the thing that's not connected to a test. Right? Why do I say that? There are three Facebook pages in Vietnam that are sharing the answers for tests for mreader.org. Students will copy. Currently, it costs 20,000 dong to get the answers for a test for mreader. So there's a problem there. Students will probably cheat. If it's under pressure, they will probably cheat. Please, let's, let's not put them in that situation. I would assess them not on the reading, assess them on something they do after the reading. So they have to read a book to do the task, which would be tell your partner about it, write about it, make a presentation, make a poster. So assess them on the task after the reading, not on the reading itself, okay? So um, I think it would be uh, very important to do this one. Um, how can I apply ER into my speaking and writing? So um, a good thing that you can do, as I said before, is skill transfer. Get them to read something and then get them to tell their partners about it. Get them to tell two or three partners. And by the time they tell two or three partners, they're gonna be getting more and more fluent and more and more fluent. Now, beginning level learners, maybe they want to write the sentences first and they can write and then read aloud to their partner. But after a time, put the paper down and then they'll become more fluent, try to remember what they've written. So they can maybe write a little review and then speak it. And then to the second person, look from the paper and then the third one, no papers. They get more and more and more fluent. And similarly writing, uh, you can get them to write uh, maybe a blog, get the other students to read the, the comments and write on their comments. So you can use a free blog uh, website like Blogspot, for example, create a class blog, Students you. write their reviews. Thank the you so much, Rob. So sorry to interrupt you. Your time's up. 
Uh, you still have a several questions over here in the, in the chat box, and I will collect um, their question and email it to you. Is that is that okay? That's perfectly fine. Yeah, but let me just um, now uh, give you uh, the where am I? Okay, here we are. I'm going to give you the link now. This sure. is the link. I'm going to paste that into here. Uh, I can see a question. Is it okay to read picture books? Perfectly fine. No problem whatsoever. And here's the slides for you. If you want these slides, please, um, please just take them now. I will also put this same link into the conference website. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rob, for your great presentation. I am really interested in um, in the 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 the, uh, the the thing that you have to suggested our teachers as a teachers to set up our own uh, library or our school library. So I think that they are really good for our um, um, for the institution to um, set up their, um, I mean, the habit for the student. Cool. Right. So yeah. mm -hmm. something I said yesterday to some people is that I'm actually leaving my university